Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the Lord Jesus, our Saviour. Thank you that he, uh, he laid down his life willingly and freely for the forgiveness of our sins. How we are held deserving sinners, but how great is your love and mercy that Jesus did that for us. And Father, you sent him and gave him and spared him not for us, but you delivered him up so that we might be set free, so that we who are unworthy, who are vile, who are worthless, we who are sinners, we who are liars, we who are have throats that are open tombs, we who have transgressed your commandments, we who have thought nothing of the holy things, we who have lived without you, we might be brought back, found, redeemed, uh, and uh, that we might be um, adopted into your family because we have faith in Jesus and trust in his blood, in his death alone for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for the Lord Jesus and the promise of everlasting life in him. Thank you that although he died upon the cross, he is resurrected and risen and reigning. And we ask and pray, Father, that we might rejoice and delight in him today. And whatever our circumstances, whatever our situation, Father, may we walk with the Lord Jesus and delight in him and uh, be ready to endure temptation for his sake and for his glory. So help us and have mercy upon us and be with us this day and cleanse us from our sin in his blood. Father, and these things we ask and pray in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Welcome to the Spurgeon's Devotional Podcast, a Christian podcast seeking to honour the Lord Jesus Christ, brought to you by David Mackerath. This is the devotion for March the 5th. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Job 2 verses 1 to 13. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Spurgeon says, even the devil will attend divine worship to serve his own ends. It is therefore a poor confidence which looks for salvation because church or chapel have been regularly attended. We ought also to watch and pray even when we are in the assemblies of the saints, for Satan enters there and is busy with his temptations. Verse 2. And the Lord said unto Satan, For whence from whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Spurgeon says, Full of evil as Satan is, he is not idle. A lazy man commits one more sin than the devil himself. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. This person says the glory of Job's character was his sincerity and uprightness. And this, like an impregnable fortress, defied the attacks of hell, though the prince of darkness himself personally assailed him with permission from God to take from him all that he possessed. Verse 4. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. Spurgeon says, Satan suggested that bodily pain would be the weapon to wound Job's faith, yea, and turn it into rebellion. There was much malicious cunning in this, for many a man has yielded before the miseries of physical pain, though he had been proof against every other trial. Yet the Lord can make his people more than conquerors, even there. Verse 6. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. Spurgeon says, In this wretched state he had no soft bed, but lay upon the hard ashes. Nor does it seem that he had either surgeon or nurse. There he sat, the prince of misery, but there was worse to come. Verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What, shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Spurgeon says, Satan tried to ruin Job through her who should have been his best com comforter, but he was defeated, for he only led Job to utter another of those notable speeches which are now the treasures of the church. Verse 11. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite, 
and so far the Namathite, for they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not, they lifted up their voice and wept, and they rent every one his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Spurgeon says this showed sympathy, but even this was not permitted to continue, lest it should comfort the afflicted one. Soon these three friends judged Job's condition and came to the conclusion that such unusual sorrow could only have been brought about by unusual sin. Under this impression, they added the last drop of gall to Job's cup by accusing him of hypocrisy and secret sin. Him is, I am a sinner, shall I dare to murmur at the strokes I bear? Strokes not in wrath but mercy sent, a wise and needful chastisement. Saviour, I breathe the prayer once thine, Father, thy will be done, not mine. One only blessing would I claim in me, O oh, glorify thy name. Amen. <laughs>